Hey, everybody. Uh, welcome to predicting community engagement on Reddit using TensorFlow, GDELT, and Cloud Dataflow. That's the session you're looking for. You are in the correct place. Uh, who am I? Uh, my name is Nick Caldwell. I am, uh, actually, I'll introduce my nonprofit first to get that out of the way. I'm a board member of a nonprofit called DevGuller, whose uh, goal is to advance uh, uh, people of color uh, into leadership positions in technology. And then maybe uh, perhaps more interesting to most folks in the room, I'm also VP of engineering here at Reddit. And uh, yeah, we got Reddit fans in the audience? Reddit fans in the audience, okay, there we go. <laughs> um, so it sounds like a lot of you guys know what Reddit is already. Uh, for those of you who don't, I'll do like a, a quick intro. Uh, Reddit is the front page of the internet. Uh, that's how the outside world thinks about us. But inside Reddit, we think about ourselves a little bit more in terms of community. So we say we're a social network where there are tens of thousands of communities around whatever passions or interests you might have, where people converse about the things that are most uh, important to them. Uh, Reddit, for those of you who know what Reddit is, you may not know some of these statistics I'm about to throw at you. Reddit is, I would say, kind of a big deal. Uh, fourth uh, largest site in the United States, according to Alexa, sixth largest in the world, 350 million monthly active users, 10.7 million posts per month, 2.8 million comments per day, uh, 58 million votes per day, and then getting back to the theme of communities, more than one million communities on the site. And when we think about uh, communities this year, particularly uh, in 2018, uh, Reddit is really trying to transform itself in the following way. We want to be able to connect people to the best, most interesting communities for them. For those of you in the audience who have been on Reddit for a long time, one question I often ask our users is how long did it take for you to find your first community? Uh, for me, that was about four years. We're trying to get the number down to maybe a few minutes would be great. Um, so Reddit is this vast network of communities, news, politics, gaming, sports, all sorts of different content we've tried to visualize here. And the question we've been wrestling with is how do we connect people with the right uh, communities? Now, later on you're gonna hear from Sergey, and he's gonna talk about uh, some really, really advanced techniques and recommendations. But I thought as a, as a cue into that discussion, perhaps we could take a trip down memory lane and uh, talk about the history uh, of Reddit's data platform, if you will indulge me. Um, so I'll start in 2006, the dark ages. Um, Trying to solve this problem of recommending content to users, our first approach was collaborative filtering. The way Reddit works, uh, for those of you who have seen it, uh, we have a system of upvotes and downvotes. So one might naturally think that if you have the same upvoting, downvoting pattern as someone else on the site, perhaps you would uh, recommend similar things uh, to each other. And this was state of the art for 2006. We represented uh, users as a matrix with posts and what they voted on. Uh, we used uh, cosine similarity distance, recentered by subtracting the global mean, and then applied SVD to get the results. Now, great for 2006. Uh, turns out it just doesn't work. Uh, we had a couple problems that we were trying to overcome. Data sparseness. Uh, you may not realize it now, but back in 2006, Reddit didn't even have communities. It was just one front page uh, listing one big pile of content, so not a lot of interesting dimensions to look at. Uh, the median number of votes per user was pretty much one, so very few people actually voting. Uh, and this meant that um, if you have the combination of everything only showing up on one page with very few people voting, you really get this mean response uh, behavior where you're just recommending the same stuff to everybody. And we had no feedback loop on that, except for uh, this is an example we've taken from nine years ago. Why does the recommended feature suck so bad? I routinely downvote every American politics story, yet my first two recommended pages are nothing but politics. Uh, OK. But there was uh, a use case for this, if you can imagine. Um, vote cheating. So what is vote cheating? Um, let me explain why you would do this. Uh, Reddit, if you can get your content to the front page, it's actually pretty valuable. Several million people are gonna see that. So to cheat Reddit back in the day, create a bunch of bot accounts, have them all upvote your content, and profit. And it turns out uh, that these bots, these cheating accounts, also have uh, very, very similar voting patterns. You can actually make a visualization of that. This is kind of clusters of people who have similar voting behavior on the site. And 
you can see that in the center, there's like the standard behavior, a lot of means, mean response voting behavior, but you can see islands of these kind of unique users off to the side, and these are cheaters. So we did find a way to use that. Now, from 2008 to 2014, uh, for those of you who understand Reddit's history, we'll call this uh, the dramatic intermission. Uh, nothing really happened on Reddit from uh, a data perspective, but the site did continue to grow. One great advantage of, of working at Reddit is the site is just addic addictive. We call it we weaponized procrastination. And it will grow in and of itself. So between 2008 and 2014, it's growing by itself. But then the gears start to come back into motion in two, 2014. Um, this is Reddit's first real data and analytics uh, pipeline. Everything previous to this was essentially just a lot of data from logs sitting in Postgres. Here we've got Kafka dumping data in S3 being processed uh, by Hive. And as you can imagine, for those of you who have dealt with, with Hive, this is kind of slow. It's not really operational. Uh, really what this got used for was every two months, Reddit has a board meeting, and the deck needs to be created. So someone would go kick the Hive jobs and generate the board deck. Uh, but it's better than nothing. 2015, we start to get just a little bit more sophisticated. Uh, we added uh, Midas. For those of you who know, that's an open source project that does uh, enrichment. Uh, we used it to enrich uh, geolocation, uh, user agent data, et cetera. Another year goes by. We're starting to get a little bit more interesting here. Uh, this is when, our, when you can finally do relevance uh, and feedback. We've got two services here, the, the blue and yellow one. Uh, Minsky, uh, for those of you uh, folks who are into classic AI, Minsky's named after Marvin Minsky. And this is essentially our first attempt at allowing the homepage to be generated uh, dynamically based on user preference. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later. And um, the second box is Spamrai. And what that is, is it uses hand-tuned rules in uh, conjunction with feedback from the community in order to try and dynamically detect spam. And this is really important because this is the first feedback loop that takes uh, data analytics and, and drives it back into the product. All right? 2017, which effectively brings us to very close to our present day system, we began forking all of our event data uh, into BigQuery after considering a lot of different alternatives. Uh, for those of you who are considering this, I highly recommend it. Uh, coincidentally, that's why they invited me to talk here. <laughs> but BigQuery is actually pretty freaking good. Uh, it's simpler to manage. Uh, it's got much faster query performance. Uh, you can connect it to a host of BI tools. Uh, we use Mode, uh, Looker, Power BI. Uh, and on top of all that, it's pretty freaking cheap, uh, which makes our uh, COO very happy. So we can't say this is a perfect solution. I do have some complaints about it but I don't really use, lose sleep over thinking about our data warehouse uh, choice, choices anymore. Um, so with that pipeline in place, let's reattempt this problem. How do we get community recommendations in this modern pipeline? Well, we now have the ability to get core metrics, what our users are doing essentially in real time. This is a, a chart of us rolling out the uh, recent Reddit redesign. If you go to www.reddit.com, you'll get to see what that looks like. This is us rolling out that uh, new system and data streaming in in real time. This allows us to attempt a few different uh, approaches. Our first uh, approach was to use Jacker distance. Um, uh, Sergey will get more academic about this later, but <laughs> jacker, jacker distance is simply a way to uh, calculate the similarity between two sets. And this was our first attempt. If you think about uh, each subreddit uh, and the people within it, the people who have subscribed to that subreddit as being a set, you can then use jacker distance to compute the distance between uh, all of the subreddits on Reddit. The problems here are that we have a lot of subreddits, about a million subreddits. This algorithm scales at O n squared. So humans did the hard part of essentially whitelisting the subreddits we thought would be most interesting, pruning out the ones that were very, very uh, undersubscribed, for example. Second problem, we have a ton of default subreddits. So in the olden days when you would join Reddit, there was no onboarding flow. We would simply subscribe you to about 20 subreddits. And this also polluted data. Uh, but we used uh, humans to clean that up as well. Um, problem with that is it, it still didn't work uh, really well. We, we still got a lot of uh, mean response behavior even after doing that tuning. Uh, but we had an insight uh, that was really important. Instead of trying to look at user behavior, what people are subscribing to and, and so forth, why don't we just do something a little bit different? And the aha moment we had is that every subreddit and the comments and the, the text that are uh, part of the forum 
really can be treated as kind of a bag of words. So can we get the subreddits simply to describe themselves and what they talk about? So take all the corpus of con commentary on a given subreddit, smash that uh, into a gigantic document, run doc to vec uh, on it, and now we convert each subreddit into a 300-dimensional vector that represents the semantics of what that subreddit is about. And that is the approach uh, we're using now. And what this gives us is we can now recommend uh, communities by topic. So if you onboard into Reddit now, you'll be given an option to choose different topics that you're interested in, health, crypto, gaming, et cetera, and we'll automatically suggest what we think are the most semantically uh, relevant subreddits to that topic. So for health, you get fitness, bodybuilding, for cryptocurrency, you get BTC and ETH trader, et cetera. Um, but maybe we can take that a little, a little further. Uh, what if you uh, already have found a community that you like? Can we recommend uh, similar communities to the one that you're already interested in? Um, so uh, we use a very similar uh, technique here using that, uh, using that data. Uh, we can get similarity to Overwatch. There's competitive Overwatch. There's Overwatch University, which teaches you how to play. There's Overwatch memes, which uh, are essentially little mini videos of people playing Overwatch. Uh, et cetera. And then you can do the same thing. If you guys are into machine learning, you can check out Learn Machine Learning, Math, Statistics, Data Science, all cover the topic of machine learning in some slightly different way. But maybe we can take this even further. What if uh, we could dynamically compute the main listings feed for Reddit? So when you go to reddit.com, you'll see a popular listing. If you're signed in, you'll see a home feed listing. What if we could make that more personalized and use signals such as what you look at, what you click on, et cetera? Reddit's old home feed algorithm, if you guys are wondering how it worked, uh, was uh, the same ranking algorithm for 12 years, a hand tuned by our most brilliant engineer uh, who's sitting in the fourth row, uh, <laughs> hand tuned algorithm that we think we could improve on. So uh, we uh, attempted to use large scale logistic regression using uh, time of day, subreddits you're subscribed to, uh, some interests that we collect during onboarding, the device you're on, mobile or desktop, and several other uh, signals. Uh, 10 terabytes of training data, 50 million features, 5 million parameters. And we currently have five versions of this model in production trying to choose the best one, but we have some very, very promising early results. Our early results are we get a 12% time on site increase with just our initial attempts. Uh, and uh, this is actually extremely good. Uh, I'll explain to you why on the next slide. Um, this is our Alexa rankings. You can see uh, Reddit, fourth, fourth largest uh, site uh, on the web. And the important number here is the daily time on site, that, that column to the far right. You can see Reddit is already the most addictive site on the internet. Uh, people who come to Reddit stay there longer than any other site, and we've managed to increase that addictiveness uh, even further. Now, <laughs> yeah, we're not letting you go. Not until the GDP of the world drops will we be done. <laughs> so that's great, but what's next? Um, now I want to introduce, um, sorry, wait, Sergey, you, you jump with the gun, man. You got you to wait, wait in the wings. I'm going to, I'm queuing you up, man. Now all of, <laughs> all of these improvements happened in about the last uh, year and a half. We're extremely excited about what we've been able to accomplish. Now. Um, uh, what I'm excited to introduce to you next is to show off some work that uh, my colleague Sergey has done. And what we view uh, this partnership with Google as is what is possible, what can happen in the next year. And uh, he's given us a glimpse of uh, some amazing results. So please welcome Sergey to the stage. Thank you. See you next time. All right. <laughs> Thanks, Nick, for the wonderful introduction. So what I, what I wanted to talk about to you today was uh, thinking this concept of uh, using machine learning, using big data uh, and data processing, and trying to come up with some predictions of user behavior. Uh, Nick talked to you about how uh, by building uh, several recommendation systems, they were able to drive the time on site uh, to pretty high values. So I asked myself this, the same question. Uh, what, if we, uh, what if we could predict popularity of news articles on Reddit. Uh, here's an example of a, a news article. It was written by one of my colleagues, uh, Martin Garner. Some of you might have heard his uh, session today. He continues writing about TensorFlow and deep learning. So this blog post is pretty uh, meta because it is talking about machine learning and TensorFlow. And so the question I ask myself, uh, if I look at this uh, blog post uh, and if I know a couple of attributes about it, 
uh, can I make predictions uh, about user behavior, specifically about uh, specifically on Reddit? Now, uh, incidentally, this blog post uh, was shared four times in four different communities by four different people. Um, so uh, I chose it because it provided me with uh, some good data on user behavior, some real user actions, and, and it also was published back in 2017. So now I have about a year worth of uh, data points that I can look back and train my uh, machine learning model on. So what are these outcomes uh, that I want to be able to predict? Uh, I want to deal with uh, prediction, uh, predictors and outcomes. And the outcome for me is a user action uh, in my desired uh, Reddit community. So the first prediction or the first outcome would be, uh, what is this subreddit uh, that, that this blog post was posted in? The other predictor or the other outcome, sorry, uh, is the person who decided to share uh, this news article uh, in the subreddit. Uh, yet another outcome is the popularity score. Uh, that's the, uh, those are the numbers on the left. And, and some of the postings achieved pretty good scores, almost 100, uh, if not more. Uh, others only got maybe a two or a five. And lastly, um, one, of the, one of the possible outcomes is the number of people who, uh, uh, users of Reddit, who come and comment on, on, the, uh, on the posting uh, and have a conversation about it. Okay, so now we understood the outcomes. Now we understood how users on Reddit work. Uh, let's talk about predictors. What are the possible predictors for me to, uh, to build my machine learning model on? Uh, one possible predictor is the, uh, the author of the blog post. So the hunch is uh, the person who writes a news article or a blog post probably has a community of readers. And these, these people will come to Reddit, and perhaps there's an overlap of the readers uh, of the author as well as uh, the users of Reddit. And so these folks will go and share it in the community of their choice. Uh, the other predictor is the textual content of the news article. That's the green stuff in the middle. That's the text, the free-form text, the topics the news uh, article is about. Uh, yet another possible predictor would be the publication time, uh, and perhaps the place, the publication domain, where this news article was posted to. So I've got four outcomes that I'm interested in. I've got four possible predictors. Uh, before I uh, jump into talking about machine learning and uh, TensorFlow and deep learning, I, I want to just quickly cover the business domain. Um, it's always good to kind of stop and think about user actions and what the business is about. Uh, I tend to think of Reddit as a huge collection of threaded conversations. Someone writes a news article. Uh, and that person is typically outside of Reddit. Um, this article gets posted to, I don't know, the Google uh, Big Data blog, or New York Times, or CNN.com, or some other uh, publication domain. Uh, a user on Reddit uh, picks up this article, reads it, becomes interested uh, in, in the content, and decides to share this news article in a community uh, of uh, his or her choice. Then people on Reddit come and begin commenting. And you have a conversation on Reddit about this um, uh, post. Across all of these entities, and now I'm switching back into architecture stuff and talking about entity relationships. So across all of these entities, uh, you always have the person who initiated this action. Uh, and you also have some differences between entities. For example, the news article will have textual content. Uh, the blog, uh, sorry, the Reddit post will have the subreddit. Uh, and the comments will also have some textual content. Well, great. So now we understood the business. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, start building our deep learning data set. And so this is our first challenge. Um, and I'm going to talk about how we solve this. Um, ultimately, what we are trying to do is to bring two streams of data. The first stream are Reddit posts and comments. The other stream of data are the news posts or the news articles. And so we were lucky that both of these data streams are actually available as public data sets in BigQuery. Uh, the Reddit posts uh, and comments are available in, uh, in a BigQuery data set that is maintained by one of our developer advocates, Felipe Hoffer. So head tip to him. Thank you, Felipe. Uh, and it draws its data from uh, a collection of uh, exports from Reddit uh, that are operated by Jason Baumgartner. Thank you, Jason, for uh, keeping this work up. Um, amazing job. 
Uh, on the news side, we also have an amazing data set. And uh, I also want to reach out to Kalev Flitaro, who is, hi Kalev, uh, who is maintaining this amazing database of news articles. Um, if, you, if you wanted to read up on it, uh, just Google the GDEL project. Uh, the GDEL project contains pretty much every news article. I might be stretching this, but it has a very big collection of news articles from around the world in lots of languages. And it has a lot of metadata about these news articles, not just the author uh, of the article or the time when it was published, the URL where it was published. It also has textual content as well as topics. And I'm going to show you how we use the topics from GDELT to make predictions. So we've got these two amazing uh, BigQuery data sets. Um, but I also wanted to do some additional processing. It wasn't enough what I already had in BigQuery. Um, so I used Cloud Dataflow, and I'm a product manager of Cloud Dataflow, and it's always useful to, be, to have access to unlimited processing power uh, to crunch through all of this uh, data. Um, so Dataflow was used for feature processing, and again, we stored everything in BigQuery. All of our features and labels are stored in BigQuery. Great, so now we understood how we build the data set. Uh, let's start having some ideas about uh, possible predictions. Um, when I like to do machine learning, um, I like to start with a hunch. And these hunches tend to be uh, about kind of user behavior or how the business is, is being run. So my hunch was um, the contents of the news article as well as where it was published. Was it the Google's blog post? Was it you know, maybe a top one site? Uh, was it kind of a popular uh, uh, news site? Uh, so these two predictors uh, are probably influencing the outcomes, which are uh, who will be reading this, uh, this news article uh, and, and the communities they will be sharing it in. Well, great. So out of the four things on, uh, on this slide, uh, three of them are pretty easy to deal with in machine learning. Uh, the publication domain, the post submitters, and subreddits, they're pretty much uh, categorical variables, you can convert them easily into numbers, and once you have numbers, you can move them into vectors, and you can train your deep learning models on them. But the first um, variable here, the news, uh, the news content, that's much more uh, trickier to deal with. Uh, and, and it is because it's free-form text. Uh, and although there are techniques today to deal with free-form text, they're not perfect. So these are the possible techniques to deal with uh, text encoding. So I'm going to talk about, for the next five minutes about uh, how we um, use some, some existing encoding techniques and brought them together with uh, deep learning and achieve pretty good results. Uh, Nick talked about using uh, doc 2 um, and it's kind of variant of word 2 uh, to make recommendations for subreddit similarity. And that's a great technique. Uh, there's also word 2 techniques for encoding text. And they have been used successfully for basic sentiment analysis and topic extraction. Uh, but even before deep learning came on board, there was a, a huge number of and, and huge volume of research done on natural language processing. And I call it pre-deep learning because um, uh, you know, Wartovec and Doctovec tended to, uh, ended up kind of overshadowing the, uh, the uh, previous research done in that space. So we actually decided to use uh, some NLP techniques to uh, encode our text and see how well it worked. And uh, I'm giving you a little bit of a preview. It did work. So here's what we do. Uh, we take a blog post, and I'll just follow the example of uh, Martin's uh, uh, news article. So we take this news article, and we extract sentences from, from text. Uh, and we'll, uh, we'll use a uh, Google Cloud service, uh, the machine learning engine, to create syntax trees. Uh, and this is an example of what is called a dependency tree. Uh, tree. It basically is a uh, tree of uh, dependencies between words in a sentence. There are other variants of uh, syntax trees, constituency trees, but pretty much you can, you can kind of solve the problem by uh, using what you see here on, uh, on the screen. Now, once we have syntax trees, uh, we can do a cool thing called entity recognition. Uh, I'll give you an example. In my, uh, in my sample sentence, deep learning is a popular approach to building machine learning models. Uh, the entity here is deep learning. There's another entity approach. And there's yet another entity models. In addition to entity recognition, you can also do sentiment analysis. And uh, nowadays, the sentiment analysis, analysis can be actually done on entity level, not just for the entire sentence, 
but uh, for specific entities. So now we know that deep learning, for example, has a positive score of 0 0.9. This indicates a positive sentence, uh, sorry, positive sentiment towards this entity. Now, uh, there are other techniques uh, going beyond kind of simplistic or simple binary positive negative uh, classification of sentiment. And these techniques were developed by, not by computer scientists, but by psychologists. Uh, in the 1980s, uh, Professor Plutchik developed a uh, framework of human emotions. And he showed that uh, all human emotions uh, could be classified uh, into eight basic ones. Uh, for those of you who can't read uh, the small font, uh, I'll just list a few of them. For example, one of the basic human emotions uh, is, is joy. Uh, another one is trust. Yet another is fear. Uh, then we have disgust, uh, sadness, anticipation. And then he also showed that every other human emotion uh, can be composed uh, as a derivative of these basic eight. For example, love, the most human emotion of, of all, uh, is actually a combination of um, uh, joy and trust. Now, uh, you can read up and uh, find some open source code uh, available uh, on GitHub by Googling GitHub Soroka Opinions. Let's say Java library that uh, classifies text uh, and parses text according to these emotions. So now we know uh, that, we, that we can do much more with text. We can uh, divide it into chunks, uh, and these chunks contain three things, triplets. Uh, what is the person thinking about an entity? What is the opinion of a person about an entity? In our sample sentence, uh, our entity is deep learning, and our opinion is popular approach. Now you might ask yourself, who is the person? The person is the person who wrote the entire article. So that's, that's how it works. And once we understood this, we can take pretty much every textual document and convert it into sequences of entities followed by opinions and opinions, and then another entity and another opinion, and yet another entity and opinion, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's going to be a long list. Uh, there's no mistake about that. But it's a structured list. It's a list of just two types, uh, which also have some attributes. So it becomes a structured problem instead of having unstructured text. And so what we know in, uh, in, in the deep learning space, once you have structure and sequences, we can go and encode them into vectors. And this is how you solve the, uh, the encoding problem, uh, because now you can much, uh, much more nicely encode your text. Uh, another beauty of this approach is that it works with pretty much every topic, existing topic classification system. Uh, GDELT is a great example of how you can easily take the topics that uh, GDELT um, uh, Identify, identified and found in text, and use it for encoding uh, text, and then using it further for deep learning. Because what, uh, if you ask yourself, what are topics? They're just basically just collections of entities. Here's an example of uh, what GDEL thinks about Martin's blog post. Um, there are four fields here. The first one is the URL of Martin's blog. So it's kosher, it's the real thing. Uh, this is exactly what's contained in the GDELT repository about Martin's blog post. Uh, and then there are three additional fields. Uh, there's a theme field, uh, there's, there's the named entities field, and locations field. Uh, and as you look, uh, if you look at the, the themes, the things that GDELT found in the news article relate to education, uh, skills, and jobs. If you read the article, you would kind of exactly match and, and uh, concur. It is about skills and uh, and uh, kind of learning data, uh, sorry, learning TensorFlow, um, uh, educating yourself. Uh, it is about open source, uh, and GDELT was also able to find some, um, some named entities. Uh, the uh, Google Cloud Platform developer, the machine learning uh, entity, as well as locations. Uh, Martin's blog contained references to Belgium. So now we have this collection of things. We have themes, we have uh, locations, we have names of people or things. And so you throw this into a bag, and uh, once you have a bag, you now know you can do bag of word encodings. And instead of naming or calling them bag of words, you're calling them bag, uh, bags of things. Uh, and there are very standard techniques in deep learning to take a collection of things and create a encoding uh, that you can then further use in uh, machine learning, in deep learning. And this is how we bring traditional techniques for textual analysis with 
novel techniques, deep learning, uh, we are able to use uh, categorical variables. And this is, by the way, a, a chart um, of a Keras model. And I highly recommend using Keras if you use TensorFlow. So this is basically a flow chart of um, uh, how, how entities and uh, variables are dependent to each other. So we take some categorical variables, such as the publication domain or the submitter of the Reddit post, and we can integrate it together with uh, textual uh, content through this bag of things encoding. Uh, and ultimately, we can make predictions about subreddits. So our last challenge uh, in this exercise was to deal with multiple outcomes in, uh, in predictions. Uh, as you've seen, um, um, as I was explaining earlier, Martin's blog was actually posted in four different communities by four different people. And uh, we wanted to be able to make predictions for multiple outcomes. Uh, I'll just give you a hand for those of you who are not dealing with uh, machine learning day in, day out. Uh, There's a very good technique, and we uh, incorporated it and embedded it in our uh, Kaggle kernel. Uh, you can uh, uh, access it later on um, for multi-label classification. Uh, all you have to do is to tweak your final output layer and replace the loss function and uh, change the output activation and do some fancy encoding of your labels. Basically use um, n-hot encoding of your labels instead of uh, one-hot encoding. So it works. It can be done. All right, so we are two slides away from the demo. Uh, what I wanted to show you was kind of concluding, now we have the data set. What, what did we actually do to develop the model? Uh, and here we, uh, we were lucky to be able to, to use tools such as Kaggle and Collaboratory. Uh, Kaggle is a great site for data scientists to develop, uh, learn, develop new models, share their models. One thing that I liked about Kaggle was uh, I was able to use uh, GPUs for training and predictions. And GPUs really make the difference. They make models run 20, uh, 20 times faster uh, than CPUs. There's another tool available, and I'll actually be using uh, it in a demo, called Collaboratory. Collaboratory is a new tool by Google. Uh, it's freely available to, to everyone. Uh, it, it's a, yet another example of a hosted uh, Jupyter Notebook. By the way, Kaggle is also a Jupyter Notebook. Uh, and if you are not yet using Jupyter Notebooks, uh, you probably should be using. So both tools are kind of versions of, uh, of, of uh, Jupyter Notebooks. Uh, but each of them has, uh, uh, has pluses and minuses. Uh, in Collaboratory's case, what I liked the most was that um, I was able to directly connect to BigQuery and get my data from Big, BigQuery. Kaggle also has a BigQuery connection, but it's right now limited to public data sets. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> well, great. So uh, yet um, just one additional thing that I wanted to mention. Uh, you might have um, uh, seen me mentioning a... Um, uh, a way for us to do feature preprocessing. So what we used for uh, transforming text and uh, finding emotions in text uh, was a Java library called Sirocco. Um, uh, Sirocco is great because it allows you to parse text and find human emotions. <clears throat> uh, and what we also used was uh, Cloud Dataflow. Dataflow was uh, excellent here because it allowed me to parallelize the processing of these millions of uh, Reddit posts and news articles. Uh, without this parallelization, uh, if I did everything sequential, it would take me years to, to process the, these huge data sets. Uh, fortunately, the combination of this uh, Java library, Sirocco, together with a distributed processing net, uh, framework, allowed me to crunch through data very, very quickly. So um, uh, I wanted to show you a demo. And the demo will be about taking Martin's blog post and doing some predictions. First off, we'll see. Uh, the prediction that the model, the train model, does for Martin's blog post. We'll see whether uh, the, the one of the, uh, one or multiple of the four uh, actual subreddits uh, are part of the predicted uh, classes. And then we're going to play a prediction game, or we're going to, to play a scenario, uh, scenario game. We're going to see if by adding one additional topic to the contents of the blog post would have changed the possible outcomes. And the other, other scenario that we're going to try will be 
What if we took the same blog post but just published it somewhere else? Not on Google's big data blog, but somewhere else. All right. And I'm going to start by showing you a uh, query in BigQuery, uh, which uh, returns uh, the, the contents of uh, the GDAL data set as it relates to, to Martin's blog. I'm just specifying the URL of my, uh, of my blog post that I'm interested in. And I'm going to run it. And very quickly, BigQuery will tell me what it knows about Martin's blog post. I'm actually going to switch to JSON format and show you all the fields we've got. This is just to show you that the contents I'm going to be using for predictions are pretty much the same as you've seen on the slide and, and uh, as, as they have it in GDELT. So we have our themes, we have our uh, named entities, and we have our locations. Now, the number that you see here on screen are the offsets of, uh, of the occurrences of these themes and locations and, uh, and names. Uh, we're actually not using them for uh, in the prediction model, but uh, there's a way for using them, especially if you wanted to kind of use a sequence uh, encoding and use CNNs or uh, RNNs. Uh, we're not going to do it, to do it today, but uh, there's, a, uh, there's some use for it as well. So I'm going to switch to uh, coll uh, collaboratory, and what it shows you is, um, is my Jupyter Notebook. There are a bunch of uh, cells here that I probably don't need. So let me start with the one that actually um, is important for the demo. So uh, for those of you who use uh, Jupyter uh, notebooks, uh, you're familiar with the concept of uh, code being in a cell and then being able to run the cell and get uh, out, uh, pre um, you know, output of your code. For those of you who don't, that's basically what's going to happen. I have uh, some Python code in each of the cells of this notebook, and I'm going to run these cells. I'm going to explain what they do and then run them, and you'll see the outputs. Uh, in this particular uh, cell, what I have here is, are all of the instructions to, to build my model and train it on my uh, test data. This is the variable that will hold the model, and uh, the inputs into this model will be two features. I will use the encoded entities from GDELT, and I will use the publication domain of, uh, of news articles. My outputs will be subreddits. That's my prediction. Uh, that's my uh, kind of label class. Uh, before the demo, I already ran the, the training, so I'm going to skip this step. Uh, the next cell, uh, and sorry for all of the comments here, I'm just going to explain what's happening here. Uh, in the next cell, I, I have my first prediction. So I wanted to show you what the predicted probabilities are uh, of, of our model for Martin's blog post without any modifications. So I just simply copied the uh, and created two variables here which uh, contain the contents of, uh, of the blog post. Here are my GDEL property or entities, and here's the publication domain of that uh, news article. In the next couple of lines, I'm going to run my encoding. And then I'm going to call the most important uh, function here in the entire cell, which is the prediction. And lastly, after doing the prediction, I'm going to print out the probabilities uh, that this model created. So let me run it. All right, so uh, here's what the model anticipates. It predicts a pretty high probability for Martin's blog post to be shared on the Futurology subreddit, as well as on the Technology subreddit and the Hacker News subreddit. And if you paid attention, uh, Hacker News was actually one of the predicted, actually one of the actual subreddits this uh, news article was, uh, was shared in. If you scroll down in the list, you will also see the second subreddit uh, which, uh, which this news article was posted to, the artificial subreddit. Now, you have to scroll pretty, uh, pretty uh, kind of a, for a long time uh, until you hit the third predicted 
class. Uh, it is in the list of projected uh, classes. It's just one of the, uh, doesn't even fit the top, top 100. It does happen, you, can, you can't always uh, uh, kind of put human behavior in a mathematical model. Uh, but having two out of uh, four, actually three out of four, uh, among the top predicted classes uh, is not bad. So here's my third subreddit, uh, which, uh, which Reddit users actually did post this blog post to, uh, and it's a top 111th prediction. Great, so uh, now we have techniques for multi-label predictions, and uh, sometimes you get uh, lots of hits, sometimes you get maybe half of the possible outcomes. But having two out of four uh, is not a bad thing. So now let's play, uh, play a prediction game. Uh, in my next scenario, I want to ask Google uh, or TensorFlow, uh, what happened if I, um, what if, if I discussed just one additional topic in my, uh, in my model? So the, the, um, the blog post today is about deep learning and TensorFlow. What if we discussed just one additional topic here? I'm gonna take 2,000 entities from my list, my dictionary of entities, and I'm gonna go through uh, each of them uh, and just compose uh, a new uh, text of the, new, of the blog post, run it through encoding, and pick the top 10 predictions. And here are the predictions. Let's just uh, go through a couple of them. Turns out, if, you, if we, um, uh, or if Martin, uh, the author of the blog, uh, wrote a little bit about hydro energy and um, uh, hydroelectricity, he would have actually a pretty good chance to be, uh, even higher chance of being uh, shared in the technology subreddit. But the top five subreddits would stay relatively the same. It would still be Hacker News, it would be Apple, it would be Futurology, and the CIDJ, I'm actually not even sure what the subreddit is about. Now let's look at another prediction. What if we, what if Martin wrote about Elon Musk? It looks like writing about Elon uh, almost guarantees you good coverage in Reddit. The, the probability of, uh, of that new blog post that has a mentioning of Elon Musk uh, uh, drives your predicted probability of being sh uh, shared in Futurology pretty high. And for the other classes, you know, the, uh, the, sub the predicted subreddits uh, stay relatively the same. Uh, they do vary in probabilities. You might get a little bit higher probability for some of the classes, but if you kind of track what's at the bottom of this chart, uh, you see the same values uh, and again and again. Okay, so this gives us something. Now we have a tool to uh, to, to be able to predict hypothetical uh, scenarios where we uh, just add yet additional topic to, to discuss in our blog post, and we have immediate outcomes uh, for possible user behavior on Reddit. The other scenario that I wanted to show you was, what if we took this uh, blog post, made no changes to the contents, but just published it somewhere else? So this code uh, goes through every publication domain uh, known to the model, and it runs predictions, and again, it picks the top 10 predictions based on the sum of probabilities. That's how they are being ranked. Okay, so let's see the outcomes. It looks like uh, if we published uh, Martin's blog uh, post on aljazeera.com, we would pretty much be guaranteed a, uh, a share or a post on the Al Jazeera uh, subreddit. So the probability is almost 86%. Uh, as well as in the Willis 7737 News subreddit. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Al Jazeera, Al Jazeera actually has a news bot that republishes content uh, that was published on aljazeera.com. So, yeah, it's kind of an obvious thing. If you publish anything on aljazeera.com, it will get uh, automatically reposted. But uh, for some other publication domains, it's not as obvious. For example, if you, if you take uh, Scientific American, then you stand a pretty good chance of uh, being republished or reposted in the uh, Raytheon subreddit. 
What are the other subreddits? Well, it's the usual suspects. It's technology and futurology, but they have all different probabilities. And now you can kind of uh, decide uh, if you have the, the, the leverage of publishing your content in different places, now you can make decisions on, okay, I've got, I, I want to go with this publisher or maybe perhaps another publisher. Um, interestingly, I've, I've seen, uh, kind of, I ran through the test samples before. Um, if, you, if you ended up getting published on MIT's technology uh, review, uh, you would actually stand a pretty good chance of uh, being republished in Artificial, which was one of the actual subreddits where this blog, uh, blog post was published on. Well, great. So uh, we've seen a couple of examples of uh, how we can use machine learning to, uh, to make predictions for hypothetical scenarios. And for those of you in the publishing industry or people who write blog posts, uh, um, I hope this was pretty con convincing uh, 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 methodology and tooling for kind of making decisions what to write about and where to publish. Uh, to summarize, um, kind of talking about accuracy of our models, uh, we, we tried a bunch of things, and the things that did work, um, I, I talked to you about today, but uh, let me summarize kind of the path to, uh, to success. When we started with uh, just textual content, and uh, the, these are two models over here, when we only use textual content of news uh, articles, uh, we achieved pretty low results. Our accuracy was in the 55, 57% range. Only when we added the publication domain to, to the mix, when we had two variables, the main and the text, uh, did we end up um, uh, pushing and moving towards the 80% range. Uh, now, uh, we, we also tried out a model where we added uh, the submitter to the mix and made it one of the predictors. You cannot use the last model for predicting future based on just the, the news article. But you can do pretty amazing um, uh, anomaly detection things. So for example, if you observe uh, user behavior on, on Reddit and it doesn't match this model, then perhaps something interesting is going on. Uh, maybe a, a bot is, uh, uh, is posting, is beginning uh, posting, or maybe a user account was taken over by someone else. Uh, we also did some predictions for popular popularity score. In some of the earlier predictions we've done or models we've built that tried to do regression and kind of uh, predict a number, you know, 55,073 as the score of a, a news article, those didn't really converge and we didn't really have good um, uh, outcomes there. But once we um, uh, switched to classification and uh, bent our scores into six distinct classes, uh, we were able to achieve pretty good results, and the conf uh, confusion matrix on, I guess you're right, uh, shows you a nice diagon a di diagonal placement of predictions uh, and true, true labels. So I wanted to wrap up and uh, just summarize what we've seen uh, today and what we talked about today. Uh, uh, we hope that uh, Nick's and my um, uh, stories were able to convince you that being able to predict uh, user behavior uh, can have significant impact on uh, the outcome of your business. Uh, Reddit was able to drive the time on site uh, higher. Uh, you can use, uh, for example, the techniques you've seen today to better place the content in different uh, 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 publication domains, or perhaps uh, choose different uh, topics you want to write about. Uh, th these techniques are not unique to social media. You can apply them in pretty much every industry. Uh, we've seen today how text encoding and multi-label classification uh, and bags of things uh, can help you, even if you are a, um, perhaps, a, you know, a car manufacturer or IoT device supplier or uh, a cloud provider, uh, to build pretty sophisticated and powerful machine learning models. Um, there's a great collection of tools here on the slide, BigQuery, Cloud Dataflow, Kaggle, and Colab, TensorFlow, obviously. Uh, I also wanted to give you a couple of links uh, for all of the code that we use today for, uh, for the predictions and sampling. Uh, there's, uh, there are kernels on Kaggle. Uh, there's code on uh, GitHub. Uh, I wanted to give a shout out to uh, Kale from GDAL project. Without his support, this, uh, this would not happen. Uh, the same goes to Jason Baumgartner from PushShift.io. Uh, without his data, again, this would not have uh, happened, as well as Felipe Hoffa. And lastly, if, you want to, if you're interested in machine learning and want to learn more, 
uh, feel free to check out the uh, Reddit's uh, subreddit. Hopefully, this will be the community that you will decide on within five minutes instead of taking four years as, uh, as Nick had. Um, but it's a great community of uh, learning resources. Thank you very much, and we'll be happy to, to take your questions after the, uh, the session.